Got it. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Bill Cabucci. I'm so glad to be with each of you today. Um, we have a small group, but uh, what I will look forward to is sharing this uh, conversation far and wide in the uh, days to come uh, with a much larger audience throughout uh, Middle Tennessee and the um, Center for Nonprofit Family, a Center for Nonprofit Management Family, I should say. Um, today, we have a small but esteemed panel of uh, folks who have worked, who have continued to work um, or have been a part of uh, the LGBTQ youth environment here in Middle Tennessee. And uh, today we'll be talking about uh, how LGBTQ plus students experience uh, school and then how they can live with pride um, and thrive in an environment that sometimes is not the most accepting and uh, supportive of their lived identities. Um, so with that said, um, I'll briefly do a quick introduction of our panel. Um, Amy Duncan is uh, with Wilco Iris and Amy uh, several years ago became aware of the lack of support systems and programs for LGBTQ youth in Williamson County. And she joined other like-minded individuals and amazing high school students to form Wilco Iris, a safe space group for youth in Williamson County. Uh, together, they bring to, together, they bring students from every local high school for community and connection with the common thread of unity and diversity. They meet twice a month for social gatherings and this past year put together the very first LGBTQ prom in Williamson County. Um, they have met with school board members as well as school counselors and worked towards making Williamson County Schools a safe place for all students. In addition, uh, Amy serves on the board of Franklin Pride as their youth activity coordinator. Amy, welcome. So glad to have you with us today. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, next up, we have Erin uh, Seymour. Aaron Seymour uses they them pronouns and is an active member of the LGBTQ plus community and identifies as non-binary in their gender expression and queer as their sexual identity. Aaron is currently pursuing an MSW degree with MTSU with a focus on LGBTQ plus youth and young adults, especially those facing homelessness and LGBTQ plus specific trauma. They are a crisis coordinator with the crisis line at the Family and Children Services, uh, at Family and Children Services as a PRN. Aaron enjoys spending uh, time with their partner, Rachel, and their dog, Dexter. Hi, Aaron. Great to have you with us. Sean Riley, uh, they, them, has gradu uh, graduated in 2019 with a uh, master's in education and learning and design from Peabody College and is currently a uh, divinity candidate studying prison and carceral studies and interreligious uh, inter encounter at the Vanderbilt Divinity School. Riley serves as the program coordinator for the Trans Body Program at the Vanderbilt Program for LGBTQ Health. And in this position, Sean works to train and coordinate peer advocates for transgender patients throughout the hospital. In this role, Riley also builds and facilitates trainings concerning LGBTQI health, especially in relation to youth with trauma-informed care, legislative advocacy, and K-12 education. In addition, Sean serves as the Student Engagement and Leadership Chair of GLSEN Tennessee and is a founding member of the Tennessee Department of Health Transgender HIV Task Force. Welcome, Sean. Glad to have you with us. And then finally, um, Kat Jefferson. Kat uh, uses they them pronouns and graduated high school in 2022 and is currently studying environmental engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. Jefferson was a member of the Glisten Shine team for two years, where they helped organize multiple phone banking events to advocate against anti-LGBTQ plus policies in Tennessee and served in a leadership role with their high school's GSA. Jefferson uh, enjoys playing music, hanging out with their dog and younger sibling and creative writing. Kat, welcome, and we're so glad to have you with us. All right. Uh, so in today's conversation, I kind of want to jump right into it. I mean, we have a lot of uh, uh, facts and figures <laughs> that really explain how uh, the lived experience of LGBTQ plus youth um, is pretty rough around uh, Tennessee and really throughout the South. 
And so kind of round robin it, um, we obviously have your uh, bios and um, a little bit about the work that you do, but what are some of the experiences that you see on the, uh, you know, boots on the ground? Uh, and you can also talk about your work as well in that perspective. Uh, and Amy, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, yeah, I uh, am fairly new on this journey. Um, my son came out, I guess, about three years ago, and shortly thereafter, I contacted all the high schools and realized there was zero support system here in Williamson County, and so um, thankfully learned about the Oasis Center and looked into some of their stuff, but he couldn't drive himself yet, and it was just kind of hard, so we really wanted to find something down here in Williamson County. There was nothing, so um, found a couple other like-minded moms, and we kind of gathered the troops and started up Wilco Iris. Um, the main thing that I observe down here is there is a vast difference between uh, kids in Williamson County and kids in Davidson County from, from these kids' perspectives. They do not feel like they have any support. Um, teachers are scared to show support in the schools because they are afraid of the backlash they're going to get from the crazy Williamson County parents. And so it's kind of up to the students and the GSA club leaders to seek out and find almost secretively the support system within their school. Um, they are allowed to have GSAs and clubs. Um, most of them are not allowed to even call them GSAs though. They have to call them something else that's very, you know, non-assuming and, and doesn't sound too scary to parents or whatever. Um, and most of the kids have to get a permission slip form signed by their family to be a part of these clubs, which is, bad news. Um, so it's just a really rough place for kids in Williamson County schools. And um, unfortunately, with the new uh, school board elections, um, all of the new uh, elected uh, school board members have an R by their name, um, which is not promising. So um, we're just working and doing the best that we can, but it's we've got a lot of work to do. John, I'll bring you into this conversation next because you're talking, you know, Amy, Amy brought up uh, GSAs and that's part of the work that you do with Listen. Uh, and then Kat, you are obviously also involved uh, in, in that work as well. And so I would be, um, I think both of you could, could tag team a little bit about what happens in the GSA in, uh, space and then also where um, some of the greatest needs are. Uh, obviously, Davidson County experience is a little bit more of a um, safe haven to some degree, um, but it's not perfect. Um, and then on top of that, um, work with Glisten goes throughout the entire state. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the, the issues that Amy was referring to from a Willis Williamson County perspective probably uh, is far worse than some of the other states around this country. Uh, yeah. so. I mean, that too. Around this country and then counties around the state. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. So, um, you know, in the last five years, the four years in, in Davidson County, um, there's been really intentional pushes for um, inclusion, particularly around LGBTQ identity. So it's actually really on it. It's been very cool to be here for 10 years and see the ways in which MNPS, the Metro Nashville public school system, has um, has has moved forward on a lot of these issues. And that was a lot of the work done by places like the Oasis Center and Big Brothers Big Sisters and just lots of different really passionate teachers and, and Glisten Tennessee and just lots of different community members um, pushing for that. That really opened the door for this kind of work to be able to be funded and to be able to be done, which is really great. Uh, and that is very different from the rest of the the, the state. <laughs> um, and we see, you know, we're able to do things like the GSA Summit here in Nashville, which is an incredible kind of resource for folks. Um, but we aren't seeing that kind of district level support, I would say, in pretty much every any other district. There are some districts that want to support, but maybe aren't able to financially support, or maybe they are um, worried about being on the public record is supportive and making themselves a target underneath, you know, the state's legislature and just um, honestly, many of the populace of the state. Uh, and so in in Nashville, we, you know, GSAs are growing. It's actually really incredible to see it grow. Um, and a lot of the outlying suburbs of Nashville are, are growing. 
Um, but we're still needing like major, major support in Knoxville and Chattanooga and Memphis and in particular uh, the rural areas of the state. I'd also add, you know, folks often don't realize and and uh, maybe Kat can speak to this, but the difficulties of GSAs in private schools, right? So in K through 12 public schools, we have a, a certain number of protections uh, for students to be able to start GSAs, right? Like if any school, if a school has any other club that's being allowed to be uh, opened and used, you know, uh, being held, then a GSA federally is has to be allowed to be operational as well. Um, but that doesn't uh, impact private schools, right? This also, uh, you know, when we're thinking about GSAs, like this is a really great way to, to meet kids, but I think in Middle Tennessee in particular, but across the state in general, I see more queer kids doing online homeschool than ever before, which is making online GSA spaces really important. So um, that's kind of the the general, uh, I would say, state of things for GSAs. Kat, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I guess just in general, is my microphone working? Since I have the new headphones. Okay, cool. Um, so just in general, with the private school I went to, which was also in Williamson County, but um, we had a lot of difficulty actually running it this year because the administration was trying to start a new policy of requiring parental permission to like participate in the GSA that we can't call it GSA. <laughs> um, so we were shut down for a whole semester trying to fight administration on that. Um, so there was a lot of talking to the administration and them comparing it to like um, a kid, like a Jewish kid joining the uh, FCA club and uh, talking about all these risks of getting hurt or whatever. It was ridiculous. Um, so there was definitely a lot of like constant meetings having to fight to get those meetings um, in order to just have a basic space. <laughs> so, yeah. I think, you know, the interesting thing here, too, is that, you know, the the 2021 uh, GLSEN school climate survey was just uh, finished, and so we don't really have the data yet for, for our conversation today, but even if we look back at the reporting from 2019, we can see that nearly 60% of LGBTQ students felt unsafe at school because of their orientation, 43% um, because of their gender expression. Um, Nearly all of those students, though, heard the word gay used in a negative way. And that was really even before the don't say gay bills that have been um, the hot, uh, a uh, Republican hot, hot topic, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Um, and, and they've been, we've been seeing those pop up all over the country and and even as small as little independent school districts there's one here in uh, one county here in Tennessee that is trying to pass that as their own policy uh, even though we don't have that law necessarily in the state even though there's um, some policy around um, curriculum and, and what can be put in schools and not Aaron, I'd like to bring you back and bringing you into this conversation and, you know, knowing that the experiences of our youth are what, we, what we're saying here, that they are hard and they are uh, they're tough. We also know that this uh, impacts uh, students' mental health in, in, a, in a big way, and that's some of the work that you're doing. Um, with Family and Children's Service. And so could you tell us a little bit about that work and what you're experiencing? Um, in, in, in your day to day? Yeah. 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 I mean, um, you know, I, the numbers are there, you know, 85% of trans and non-binary youth and then 66% of just LGBTQ youth in general, um, report mental health, um, issues related to some of these trans and anti-LGBTQ bills that are being addressed in Tennessee. Tennessee alone has the most bills over 30%. So, or over 30 bills being looked at that um, attack LGBTQ people. So, you know, we're, we're looking at students who are going into these environments with minimal support uh, by adults, by peers, and we're expecting them to, get, you know, like keep it together. Um, take care of yourself. And it's just, you know, especially the students who feel they have to hide their identity and 
that's what we are seeing on a crisis line is a lot of students re reaching out to us um, using private numbers, um, uh, you know, uh, identifying suicidal ideation and suicidal behaviors, you know, um, risk factors that we should be more concerned at. Um, there's also high rates of suicide, of, of, you know, homelessness and in rural areas and in, in the South in general. Um, so these are all things that we're hearing um, on the crisis line and having to document and um, we're, we're involving, you know, mobile crisis units to respond and, um, and, and this is all happening with students who, you know, are uh, who aren't able to go to their parents, who aren't able to go to adults in their lives for fear of discrimination or for fear of rejection. And, and that's a lot to put on a, a student. And it's, it's a lot to put on anybody. I mean, especially adults who, you know, have, have the capacity and have, you know, the, the resilience to, to handle these things. So, um, yeah, it's, it's alarming to say the least. Yeah, I think it's it is it's it's not only alarming, but it's also in some cases it, I, I would, it's borderline depressing. I mean, there's a stat right now that I'm reading that says, you know, vast majority of LGBTQ students, 87 uh, percent from this uh, Glisten survey, have experienced harassment or assault based on personal characteristics, including their sexual orientation, gender expression, um, actual or perceived religion. Um, their actual perceived race. So it goes far beyond just how they identify. And it's, it's this, it's this um, level of, of uh, distaste for other that somehow permeates the, a certain culture, uh, our, our culture. And I think that is the importance of these GSA programs, but at the same time, it's the importance of these of parents to step up and actually do the work. And so, Amy, I'm going to toss back to you here. You know, talk talk to us a little bit about the the formation of Wilco Iris and uh, the work that that you all are doing in Williamson County. And then, how could how can that work then be duplicated? Right? How can that be brought to other parts of the state where where there are like, some of the greatest needs? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, it's 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 really hard in these areas where they're not even allowed to have a GSA or a club. Um, because for our kids, that's kind of a new thing in Williamson County. They're actually having to allow them now, even if they can't call them that. And it's a lifeline to these kids. Um, it's still heartbreaking to me that there are no adults involved in these clubs. For the most part, it is a a, a teacher that volunteers to sponsor it, but they are hands off and they are way hands off because they don't want to get involved in the politics of the school. Um, and so they are just relying on hopefully a student leader steps up to lead the GSA this year. And if nobody does, the club falls apart. So it's very unstable and it doesn't feel very, um, you know, well organized a lot of times, depending on, you know, the students and how busy they are and, and what they're able to give to the club. And they only meet some of them for like 30 minutes once a week. And so it's just very limited in what it's able to really provide as far as support and community goes. And so that's why we started Wilco Iris is because we wanted to connect all the different groups of kids from different high schools and give them an opportunity to know each other because that makes their world feel a lot bigger, makes them feel a whole lot less alone to know that, oh, Ravenwood's got this awesome GSA club and all their students are going to get together with us and we're going to do all this together. Um, so that's the dream. Um, it has been slow growing just because unfortunately, a lot of our students that would want to come to these social gatherings are scared to. Um, they're not out to their parents and so they'd have to lie to their parents about where they're going or what they're doing and then it becomes this whole icky, awful feeling, you know, that just adds to their angst and their mental you know distress and so our battle is trying to find um ways to gather that's safe for everyone and we're still working on that you know finding neutral locations at a park or wherever where it would feel totally normal for the kid to want to go to the park and hang out with friends and the parents don't necessarily have to know it's because they're meeting with other like-minded students and so um 
you know, I think you do what you can, um, you know, so for these other more rural counties that can't have school clubs, I don't know, you know, it, it's heartbreaking to me to think about how are these kids to, supposed to find each other and find support in their, in their world. I mean, I think a lot of them are just holding their breath and trying to survive high school till they can get the hell out of there and, and get off to college and be who they really are. And it shouldn't have to be that way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I welcome advice from all of you guys and I'm all in to help spread this around Tennessee in whatever way we can. I think you know who I'm gonna to go to next, Sean. <laughs> with your work with Glisten, uh, Tennessee throughout throughout the throughout the state, uh, and obviously with your specific focus around uh, youth and youth and education, mm -hmm. um, what what are some of the best practices, and what are some of the things that can be done? And and if we just think small, right? Right now, let's just talk about Middle Tennessee because there's still so much need. Davidson, Williamson County, but then we have ten other you know, donut counties around us or, or, or tertiary counties around us that have specific needs. I mean, the reality is that queer people live everywhere, right? Yeah. And so it's not just in the in the blue cities, right? They they are everywhere. Just the other, just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a, a father who um, has a, a kid in Rutherford County schools mm -hmm. and they live on the border. Rutherford County and, and Davidson County and and there is nothing for their child to be engaged in and you know what, what are the what are some of the best practices what are some of the things that we can do uh, to address those specific needs yeah I mean I do want to say that I think it, it very much varies from year to year and region to region or district to district but I would say like yes, our, our young people are very under-resourced as far as like supportive teachers and like having infrastructure for GSAs, but by and large, I just also want to celebrate just like the resilience of the kids that they, who are making it work. Like I work with kids from all over the state who maybe they don't call it a GSA, but you know, they, they all know it's a GSA, right? Um, or they know there's this one teacher that they can go eat lunch at and and kids are really, really young people are just brilliant at making it work with what they got. And um, I think a lot of what the best practices can be is leveraging those things that young people are really good at. And so particularly in the last few years, um, looking at things like digital, like online meeting spaces, right? And allowing for young people to not even be on camera if they don't want to. Maybe they're sitting, I have young people that come to our meetings and they're sitting and they have their headphones on and they can't speak because it would out them in some way, but just like sitting in the meeting with folks is a helpful thing. Creating these discord servers. I know that many kind of youth serving organizations and just LGBT like friends groups um, have them or have been really incredible to help people connect. I think honestly, the young people of today are in, for better or worse, um, more connected to other young queer people than ever before, because most of them are on TikTok and on Discord and on YouTube and um, are able to, to meet. And I think leveraging those spaces, especially when we're thinking about um, rural spaces and, and getting to folks across the state, I think we need to think about the lessons that COVID has taught us, honestly, about connecting to our, our family when uh, we're not able to otherwise. And I think really just leveraging Whenever we have like uh, a district that is even leaning a little bit towards supporting, like just offering as much support as we can to those districts, just as everyday parents and people, because, you know, I've been to many of the Williamson County school board meetings, for example, and the school board sits there and has a certain group of people yell at them for an hour and a half. And then oftentimes there's not folks willing to kind of share the other side. We see that in Davidson. I see that in Bartlett. I've seen it across the state. And so I think we really need districts willing to step up. We need parents who are willing to, to voice their opinion and voice their support. Um, and I think we just have to leverage the brilliance of young people. And that's gonna be different for each school and each in each place, but thinking about designing things with young people, I think is always more um, uh, fruitful than trying to come in and, and do, you know, it's all very context specific and young person specific is what I would say. Okay, I'll stop talking. <laughs> uh, no, I think I think it's I think it's actually wonderful. And this is where I want to bring Kat into the conversation. 
Um, and, and Kat, you, you recently graduated high school. You're just starting college, uh, starting university. Um, you're part of the Glisten and Shine team um, for a number of years. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the, the, the involvement that you had with Glisten and um, what, uh, what are some of the things that you learned and, and some of the things that we as, I'm not going to say older adults because I put too much Botox in my face to say that, um, but, <laughs> um, you know, what can we learn from from you and 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 your peers uh, in terms of applying these things to uh, to help young young people? Yeah, um, I actually found Glisten and like Shine Team through the virtual GSA meetings that they ran during COVID, where it was a lot of just like talking and playing Jackbox games, and it was just like a place to be around and talk to other queer kids, which was like really cool, especially during COVID when we didn't have much interaction with like people in general. Um, but yeah, so that was a great way. Even if we didn't fulfill like all of your needs, it was a place to, you know, find connection and stuff. So then that was why I got involved with Shine Team more directly where we um, like we did the political stuff. And then we also talked about um, doing more of those Shackbox games meetings for um, kids who weren't on the team and just, you know, uh, we have a group me chat so we can share memes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so those virtual spaces are really like good for kids who don't have that space in school. Um, I found that really useful for me personally. Um, and also just providing support for making those in-person spaces also was um, really helpful. So, yeah. Aaron, I'll bring you into the conversation here. And from a, from a, digital perspective, what tools have you uh, engaged with at FCS? Oh, I said that right. Um, and, you know, what, uh, what what digital tools are available that you have used um, or what are, um, and, and Sean, maybe you can jump in here too. What are some of the other places that are maybe a little bit more, um, are, are there platforms that are managed by LGBT affirming organizations that can help support this level of additional connection. I'm aware of one, but there's so many of them. So let's talk, let's talk about that. There are so many of them. And you know, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm 31 years old, right? So uh, I've had the privilege of kind of seeing all these streaming services like Netflix and, you know, HBO, Hulu, all these places start coming um, into the framework of, you know, our digital setting like day to day. Um, and we've also seen, even just within like the last year or two, um, a huge amount of LGBTQ content come through. A lot of it is really well done. There's TV shows like Heartstopper, for instance, that are, um, that are really amazing and that kind of show you sort of like this normalcy with LGBTQ identity that you don't have to, it's it's not a weird oddity thing. You're you're able to find yourself and you're allowed to be around other people and you can take up space. Um, so those are things that, you know, even at, on the crisis line, I've heard, um, you know, this new generation saying, you know, the content's there, but I'm not seeing it and I'm not feeling it, you know? So I think that's, that's an important thing too is, um, having spaces where students can go to to feel that and to to see it um like discords and you know um gsa things like that um you know even from a mental health standpoint the most important tool we have is affirmation affirmation can go such a long way um and i think that's what a lot of these uh this content that we're seeing is is providing is affirmation that it's okay to be you and it's okay to take up space and you're not wrong the people who don't see you and don't want to um affirm you are wrong so um that's that's just my takeaway of all that sean yeah i mean i think there's <clears throat> Lots, as you shared, just so many different kind of platforms. I think the um, definitely the expansion of representation is super helpful for our young people's ticket 
getting people to connect over. There's also like actual physical platforms so that are specifically designed for LGBTQ youth. So there's um, there's like Trevor Space, which is specifically uh, a space for LGBTQ youth who have experienced this crisis in some way to connect. Um, that's been really helpful. There's also Q Chat, which is specifically only kind of um, chat based, you know, no like photos or videos or anything like this, which I think is is kind of unique. Um, I honestly think also the app Lex, which some people sleep on, is really, really helpful for some LGBTQ youth. It's a it's a um, what's the word I'm trying to say? Words only app, kind of like old Craigslist ads no photos. You can now connect your Instagram, which is new. But I see young people posting like, hey, I'm looking for an older person to talk to me about this thing. Or, hey, I'm looking for um, somebody to give me advice on uh, starting hormones on this kind of medication, just wanting to hear from the community. And those, and honestly, Facebook groups, mess around and find out about transgender Facebook groups <laughs> um, for particularly like my age and younger, like college age folks. But there are just so many trans in particular specific Facebook groups and um, that have been really, I think, helpful for younger people to learn from older folks that have gone through transition or have gone through um, schooling in a time where, you know, there's escalating violence against trans and queer folks. So I think a lot of those spaces have been really helpful. And then, of course, there are like, I'm pretty sure Oasis still does the, they have a Discord, I'm pretty sure, but they still do their online meeting and they're doing in person too, I believe, if I'm correct, Joseph, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but like all of those spaces, I think we need just all of the different options for our young people. Um, but I think honestly, the most powerful that I see are the ones that they kind of carve out themselves. It's these like trending things on TikTok and the, you know, specific reel that goes that goes viral that young people are really connecting to each other over. Thank you. Um, I think I, I haven't heard of Lex before myself. And so I think that's a great, a great thing I'm gonna check out. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, one of the ones that I'm familiar with is a, is a relatively new platform um, that was developed in, in partnership with Hope Lab and Centerlink called IMI. Uh, and that uh, link is in the chat as well. Uh, and that's another resource, but it's it's more of a, a way to, it has a lot of guides built for and with uh, LGBTQ teens in mind, um, focusing on stress and stigma, gender identity, um, queerness, but then there's also uh, ways that you can get uh, text message uh, um, encouragement and, and some other really great resources uh, within their platform. Uh, and then also uh, in partnership with Centerlink, there is a Q chat space as well. It's not the most tech um, friendly platform. They probably don't want me to say that, um, but it is certainly one that's out there that uh, is also a great a great resource to build to build community. Um, but I, I think the other thing that, that's important to note too is that community cannot only be built by a digital screen, right? And the more that we can have community with one another, um, with in-person um, opportunities, uh, the stronger our communities will be, you know, in 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 the years ahead. Uh, because the more that we can learn from one another, the more that we can be in community, um, sharing a cup of coffee or sharing a, a, a film together or art show or just a community space uh, is obviously a, a really important piece of um, our collective work as a community. Um, and so I see here Joseph from Oasis just mentioned that they're um, in-person and virtual programming for middle and high school youth uh, beginning the week of August 22nd with Oasis Center. Um, and then they use Discord for that for that work. Um, I, I want to pivot over to a kind of a harder topic, um, but one that is also really uh, something that plagues a lot of our community, and that's the trauma and suicide risk among LGBTQ youth. I mean, we've we've talked about the hard harder experiences that um, LGBTQ youth experience just in existing in in high school uh in high school or in middle school uh, and especially if they're coming from a family where there's not uh, a support mechanism uh surrounding them and so um you know 
according to the Trevor Project and, and a research piece that they released actually just last month, uh, they're showing that it's uh, LGBT youth, LGBTQ plus youth who have reported high levels of trauma symptoms had more than three times greater odds of attempting suicide in the past year uh, compared to those with no trauma symptoms or low and moderate trauma symptoms. And I think that that is a, uh, that is a number that should stop us all in our tracks. Um, and it is something that even is higher um, based on certain races and ethnicities. Um, and those uh, symptoms of trauma are typically higher with LGBTQ youth of color, multisexual youth, um, transgender, and non-binary youth as well. Um, Aaron, I bring you into this conversation on that because of the, the crisis line and the work that you're doing with FCS. Um, what, what is the day-to-day -day experience that, that you're seeing on the ground? And, and um, what are some of the things that we can be doing to support beyond uh, just trying to be there, if you will? It's, it's hard because um, just even from a research standpoint, there's not enough information to tell us where to go from here. I mean, even, I mean, we know where to go from here. We know that, you know, adults um, need to do the research. We know that parents need to be um, available emotionally to their children, you know, um, but it, there's just not enough information out there um, to, to even explain most of, you know, what we're seeing. So um, day to day, it, it, is, it is really daunting. It, um, and I'm sure, you know, uh, with Trevor Project being a place where youth can reach out to directly um, for crisis specific to um, their queerness um, or, or just even in general, um, our numbers tend to be a little bit lower, hopefully for that reason, but um, I think there's also a level of fear with reaching out, right? Um, and I think that's sort of this idea that if, if they call, we may need to um, reach out and tell their parents if they're having suicidal ideation. So there's, there's a level of fear when it comes to um, reaching out. Um, that's not to say to that, you know, um, students don't reach out and they, they do have crises. I mean, the mo uh, one call I've taken is um, from, you know, a, a trans girl in a closet at school crying and, you know, kind of having an emotional um, breakdown, so to speak, you know, um, feeling, feeling un misunderstood, feeling unaccepted and um, so, so those are the kinds of calls that we receive, and it's and it is really um, difficult to to hear, you know, um, just how how hard it is out there for everybody, and especially um, marginalized communities, as you said, um, our you know BIPOC population experiences far more trauma. Um, just because they have these layers of identity, um, it's, it's all, you know, kind of connected to this bigger idea that, you know, we have, we have these communities that believe in conservative values that we as queer people don't fit into. And that's not anybody's fault, um, you know, that because what they believe is not exactly, um, correct or, or, you know, um, safe for our youth. I feel like I'm rambling now, but yeah, the, the point is, um, you know, people are reaching out and, um, and, and we are at a place where we need to start, uh, doing something about it. We need to start investing in research. We need to start, um, looking at these, uh, parent child relationships and other relational assets that LGBTQ youth are missing and, uh, don't have. So. Can I, can I just add to that? Um, <clears throat> so I think, yes, I think a big thing is like helping to build families that can support LGBTQ folks. I think it's like working in the schools, but I also think that 
I mean, I know for a fact that some of the students who we've lost in Tennessee specifically over the last few years came from the most supportive families that you could ever imagine. And it just wasn't enough, right? It wasn't enough and went to schools in the city, right? Went to schools in, in, in areas that maybe weren't labeled as conservative, but the everyday rhetoric that's in our media, the conversations that are happening in legislative law rooms, um, the ways in which teachers are allowed to sit, speak to young people are all, I, I, I think you're right in that we do have to do our investigative research, but also like I can point to a hundred reasons right now why um, my young people are, you know, delve into crisis. And a lot of it is just the lack of, of, of inf like infrastructure and institutional supports. Um, you know, we had a kid to 12 year old kid in middle school, complete suicide in Bell Buckle, Tennessee in the last year who came from the most supportive parents who were devastated that this kid is gone, but the kids were bullying this 12 year old so badly that drove them to suicide, right? Like, and so I just think we have to like, yes, we have to think about families so much of the time when I work in the psych hospital, the kids that land in the psych hospital are there because of crisis with their family. Um, I think that's a, a huge thing to intervene on. And I just think it's, it's at every level. Um, yeah, the other thing I would think about just as far as like when, when it comes to building these relational supports, I think the frustrating thing, but also kind of helpful thing about kids who get kicked out of their house or kids that are, have like some kind of major break with between their relationship with their family is typically those things are, are being built up to, right? It's not like not, most of the time, actually, people, student, kids come out, they don't get kicked out that exact moment. Maybe they get kicked out a few months later. Maybe there's been conversations that led up to this. But I think that's actually opportunity because it's not just one breaking point that we can't really kind of uh, anticipate happening. We can kind of see these things happening in our communities and really try and work with the folks that we see struggling with the kids that are LGBT, right? Go talk to the folks at your church that you know that their kid may be LGBT and they're spouting these kind of like rhetoric, right? I just think we have to be thinking about it on, on just so many different levels. Um, and even when kids are in like the most supportive environments and have like the best things, like our healthcare system, our education system, our, our just our support systems for them just fail in this country, unfortunately. I think some of it too, Sean, I mean, you, you talk you talk about supportive families, right? And and that plays a really in, important role, and um, to to a lot of this. But sometimes having, would you say too that having the supportive family can only go so far in with the school systems? Right? Yeah, so, and you have like badass moms. Like we have badass moms every day who are showing up at the school board meeting is showing up at the principal's office, you know, badass parents in general. And it's just not enough when you have a whole system with a whole state's legislation backing you. It's impossible when you have teachers that are getting fired for starting GSAs like that happened this year in Tennessee. It's an, it's an impossible system. We need lots and lots of different families. We need lots and lots of folks caring about these issues. And honestly, I would bet most Tennesseans do. We're just tricked into thinking they don't. And we just have to really figure out ways in which we can connect to the others that do, you know, are really um, anxious about the, the health of our young people in our state. Amy, I'll bring you into this conversation because you're a parent who cares so deeply and you're a parent who has taken your, um, your pain, your, your hurt for your child and you've put it into incredible action. And that's something that is so worth celebrating. That is something that is so worth um, highlighting. Um, without going into sort of the depths of all of what you've experienced in, in your in your personal uh, family history, um, what are some of the things that, that parents can take? Parents who are watching this in, in a recording, you know, three weeks from now, five weeks from now, what, is some, what are some of the things that they can take out of this as, as points that they can start implementing in their homes, things that they can be doing in school to empower them to create 
uh, a more accepting environment for their students' youth, uh, students' uh, education experience. And then Kat, I'm gonna go to you with the same question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been really amazing to see the parents come out of the woodwork um, as they learn about Wilco Iris, as they see the posts that our students make. We get random messages from random people, like so excited to know that this group of students exists and it gives them hope. Um, you know, for their own child or for other families that they know that are, you know, in the community. And so that has been really encouraging. Um, all of our students, I wish Preston could have been here today. He's one of our student leaders that just graduated, but um, they have talked about the importance of having other adult voices affirming them. Cause like, you know, Sean said, your family is important and that encouragement is awesome but all these kids are also growing and developing and becoming their own unique individuals you know going towards adulthood and so they need to know they're okay outside the walls of their comfort family um and so just having more voices speaking into their world um so you know we always encourage parents once they reach out to us to go up to the school meet with the administrators find out what the school is doing to support your child because the school's not gonna listen to outsiders, they're gonna listen to parents that are within their school system. And so it's so important for parents to be the voice for their child, um, to pay attention to what's going on in the media and check in with their kids and have those conversations that help them process all the heaviness that's in the political sphere right now. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I just think the more we can dive into our little sphere of influence and start those conversations and say the positive words and encourage, 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 um, you know, those baby steps add up to something. And we're, we're seeing the impact um, within our school system. We had um, a meeting with some of the school board members recently. Only two showed up. We invited the whole board. And the two that showed up, of course, were progressive in their thinking. It was lovely conversation. Um, but one of the best things that came out of that is that the wife of one of the school board members came and she is the head of the counseling department for the high schools in Williamson County. And she brought along her friend who's the head of the middle school counseling department. And they got so fired up listening to our students and realized how important it is to get the school counselors the resources that they need and the education that they need in order to serve these students better. Um, you know, just hearing the mental health statistics and everything, I think that just kind of blew their minds and hopefully it's gonna start a trajectory of, you know, really diving into the ways that our schools are failing these kids. So um, yeah, baby steps are important. Yeah, I agree 100% with what you said, Amy, um, because like, especially, the parents that are against LGBTQ people are so loud. It's important for the parents that are supportive to be just as loud, you know, um, because when we were fighting to get our GSA back running this year, the parents that were supportive were really important in getting the administration to see that it's not just the people who are against it, who complained about our like bisexual awareness, like week presentation that they weren't the like loudest people with an opinion, you know? Um, so, even if you're not starting a Wilco Iris, you know, getting uh, involved with your school, showing your support can go a long way in helping, um, you know, your kid and the school as a whole to be more um, pro LGBT. Sean, I'm going to call out some of these links that you put here in the chat and we'll make sure that those are readily available, but there's some really fantastic resources just in the cursory view that I've taken of some of these some of these links, uh, I stumbled upon Changing the Game, which is a game plan for, for teachers uh, to create safe and inclusive classrooms for LGBTQ students, a game plan for LGBTQ plus athletes and allies, uh, and then how to create safe and inclusive teams um, for, for those athletes. I mean, there's some really great, great examples here. Um, plans for parents and caregivers and families um, it, it is, so there's some really great content here that is worth sharing and, and worth, uh, you know, uh, amplifying in, in our own networks and our own circles. Um, and so I, I, I'm very thankful for, you know, for this conversation today. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I just appreciate everyone who's, who's sort of given their, um, their viewpoints. Um, because we have a small uh, live audience today, we're not going to have a time for uh, sort of question and answer. Um, and so we'll, we'll be wrapping this up here in a few minutes um, and then sharing this out far and wide. And so I want to thank each of you very much for your time today. Um, is there any one sort of, as we tie this up, is there one last thing that we want to leave with, um, encourage uh, not only students who may be watching this, but parents or educators who may be watching this um, with one, one last word of advice and encouragement as we head into the school year? And I'll popcorn it so whoever wants to go can go. I'll go. Um, I would just say it is so important to find your community, your community of parents, your community of students, whoever you need. Um, we have just seen huge, huge results from people finding that community and feeling like they belong. Um, and so we as, as Wilco Iris and, and our adult task force are here to help people plug in. That's one of the things we do through our parent uh, Williamson Social Justice Alliance group is if you have something you're interested in or passionate about, reach out to someone like us and we'll plug you in because there's so many good things being done in the state that people don't know about. So finding your community opens the doors to lots of those opportunities. Thank you, Amy. Erin, Sean, Pat? Yeah. I know Erin, you had to hop off, so I don't know if you wanted to go first. Or... Yeah, yeah, I can hop in. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for this conversation. Um, someone from Colorado who has experienced support in, in a high school setting, um, it is, it, it, this is kind of new territory for me, and I've kind of taken away a lot of learning from y'all, um, especially you, Sean, and Amy for sure and Kat of course. Um, so if and I've added my email down below. Um, I, I I'm working with um, FCS and the crisis team to kind of have a better handle on how we can better support students who are reaching out in crisis. So if there's any feedback or any thoughts or um, uh, anything like that that you want to share, please definitely do. Um, we want to sort of be better and have better support in place. So thank you again. Um, I would just say, as, as Amy shared, like find your resources. Like it could often feel like Tennessee, there isn't a ton of resources. And that is true to a certain extent, but there are just badass people across the state who really, really care about our kids and they're around. Um, and there's different ways to plug in. If you just want to show up at LGBT events and give queer kids hugs because they don't get hugs from their family, like go join Free Mom Hugs Tennessee, right? Like if you have a group of burned up, you know, burning up parents and want to start a group to meet, you know, outside of the schools, just do it. Like you can do it. Um, and there are folks around who, our possibility models and resources and we all chat like we all try and talk to each other so if you just reach out to whatever organization you can find and usually folks are able to to kind of uh get you rooted to the right place so um please reach out to glisten tennessee as a resource if, or the trans buddy program as a resource if y'all have any questions about lgbt health or lgbt kids in schools um, and if you have something that's a question about something else, reach out anyway, and I'm sure we can connect you. So um, please just know that there are resources as, as scary and isolating as Tennessee might feel sometimes. Yeah, I agree hundred percent with all that. The resources like are really important. I just wanted to say to like, remember to keep fighting. Don't let the negative stuff, like all the bills in the legislature that are you know happening currently, don't let that discourage you too much from like continuing to fight, especially since like even during my four years in high school, so much changed. Like we didn't even have a GSA um, when my when I started high school. So just remember that even if it feels like you're not doing anything, every little bit helps, you know, so. Yeah, it's, um, I appreciate all of you so much for, 
for all that you've shared and and the um the, the feedback from from today's conversation um there will be a list of, of of resources and connection and opportunities to get involved from from wilco iris to uh, volunteering with FCS to the myriad of opportunities that Sean is involved in here in the in in the mid state, and so I am uh, so very much thankful for each of you and for the work that you do. Um, Kat, have a great school year. That was really cheesy. That thing that 